Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the third final day of uh, this great New Horizons meeting. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're beginning today with our theme of just research updates. And uh, very pleased to have with us three distinguished doctors involved in just research and treatment. And uh, I'd like to begin by introducing Dr. Kira Kelly. Dr. Kelly is a clinical investigator and medical oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. She trained at University College Dublin and completed a visiting scholar fellowship at Sloan Kettering, doing research on the molecular landscape of GIST. In 2017, Dr. Kelly was awarded an American Society of Medical Oncology Young Investigator Award and Merit Award for her research. As a clinician, she specializes in the management of patients with GIST and sarcoma. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Kelly. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, with me as I just share the screen. David, can you just confirm that you can see my slides properly? No. I'm not okay, yet, screen. no. Okay, bear with me. <laughs> Sorry. There we go. There you go. Okay, great. Is that coming up properly or just the... It's not in. Uh, if you go on the speaker view. Yeah, no problem. One second. Great. Very good. We can see the screen that has your rem your reminders. Yeah, on I'm it. just trying okay. to get it to change. <laughs> just letting you know which screen is showing. Yeah. I'm gonna just stop it for a second. One second, sorry. Sorry, having trouble with my mice. <laughs> Can you just give me a few minutes? I'm sorry, I don't know if somebody else, I think I need to stop sharing it. I'm just finding it difficult to- That's okay, uh, take a moment and maybe while you're doing uh, getting, I should say this is the first time in the history of Zoom meetings that anyone has ever had a technical problem. Just, just <laughs> kidding. So we're, used to, <laughs> we're all used to this by now yeah. um, after two years of pandemic. So while, while you're uh, dealing with that, let me just introduce our other speakers for today. Okay. Uh, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Suzanne George. Dr. George is a medical oncologist at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, focusing on sarcoma and GIST, with a particular interest in developmental therapeutics and clinical trials. Uh, Dr. George received her medical degree from the University of Massachusetts Medical School in Worcester and has been in practice for more than 20 years. She's a member of the multidisciplinary team at the Center for Sarcoma and Bone Oncology at Dana-Farber in Boston. And our final speaker is going to be Dr. Bruno Vincenzi. Dr. Vincenzi is the Associate Professor of Medical Oncology at the Campus Biomedico University in Rome, Italy, where he teaches immunology and medical oncology. He's actively involved in clinical and translational research, specializing in molecular diagnostics, and markers of prognosis and response. He has a particular interest in cancer angiogenesis and in the development of anti angiogenic drugs. So this morning, we're going to hear from each of these doctors, and then we'll be having a uh, general session to talk about unmet research needs. And uh, now I'll turn it over again to Dr. Kira Kelly. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I think my slides are correct now. Yes, yep, great. Good. great. 
So thank you very much um, to the organizers, Sarah and David, to everybody in the Life Art Group for inviting me to talk today. And I decided I'd focus my talk on immunotherapy and GIST. Um, here are my disclosures. And firstly, so the immune system has two types of response. There is an, an innate immune response and, a, and an adaptive immune response. In terms of the innate immune response, this is something that's time independent, not specific to any antigen and is, consists of a variety of um, immune infiltrating cells. And then the adaptive immune response is time dependent. It's specific to um, a particular antigen and um, involves a memory function. And this is whereby we see um, a foreign object enters the body, an immune response is initiated, the adaptive immune response um, comes into play where B cells start producing antibodies and they're retained within the body for each time thereafter that that foreign particle enters the body that that reaction will kick in. So what do we know about the immune microenvironment in GIST? So we know that in terms of the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, we see um, a high proportion of T cells and macrophages. With respect to the T cells, we see each type of T cell within the tumor microenvironment in GIST. So we see helper T cells that help essentially the CD8 cytotoxic T cells that I think of in terms of trying to eradicate the foreign particle from the body. And then the regulatory T cells, which are more immunosuppressive and are trying to dampen the immune response and create an equilibrium within the body. And in terms of the macrophages, when it's been looked at in preclinical models, we've seen that um, um, macrophages are present in both primary and metastatic GIST, but in a higher proportion of metastatic um, uh, cases. And we see that there's a correlation between the macrophages and the, uh, the CD8 uh, Treg cells, the, so which are immunosuppressive. So the phenotype of the macrophages are immunosuppressive, M2 macrophages. And it, when we look at whether or not treatment plays a role in, in the presence of the macrophages or their immuno, what the immunosuppressive macrophages, really there, has been, there hasn't been any evidence of an effect from treatment. So overall, the immune microenvironment in GIST is an immunosuppressive one. So what do we know about imatinib with respect to the immune um, response in GIST? So we know that imatinib potentiates anti-tumor T cell responses in GIST through inhibition of IDO. Um, this is from work by Vinod Balachandran um, and Ron DiMatteo. Uh, published in 2012. And essentially, it's, we saw that imatinib in preclinical mouse model, it just mouse models, we saw that imatinib increased the cytotoxic CD8 T cells within the tumor and draining lymph nodes. It decreased T regulatory T cells and the immunosuppressive um, cells, and therefore shift the ratio of cytotoxic um, T cells to T reg cells in favor of a cytotoxic um, CD8 phenotype, which is it seen in other cancers as well to be associated with a favorable outcome and prognosis. And how did it do this? It did. It was shown to um, incorporate um, inhibition of IDO1. IDO1 IDO is an intracellular enzyme that converts tryptophan to kynurenin, and kynurenin is an immunosuppressive um, to the microenvironment. And so it was also shown that imatinib mediated the reduction of IDO1 through um, its ability to block its signaling. So therefore, the tumor needed to be sensitive to imatinib. And they also showed synergy between imatinib and an immunotherapy agent, a CTLA4 um, inhibitor. So this is a lovely diagram of the potential IO strategies and GIST that are currently being looked at or have been looked at. And I took this from a nice review article that's been published this year. Um, and we'll go through each of the potential um, avenues that have been looked at so far. So the first is cytokine-based therapy. And this paper is from 2012 also. Um, it included eight GIST patients that were treatment naive. And they were, um, the treatment that they received was PEG, interferon alpha 2b, and imatinib. And they saw a um, clinical benefit rate of 100%. All patients responded. Um, and in fact, one patient had a complete pathological um, response in their tumor. And it was nice. This study was really great with respect to the correlative data that they showed because they had samples pre and post treatment 
in this individual who had a great response. And they saw at baseline, um, there was no interferon gamma expression on IHC. They also had controls from three cases that had been uh, taken after imatinib therapy. And similarly, they did not express interferon gamma. And then after the combination with PEG interferon alpha 2b and imatinib, they saw expression of interferon gamma. And interferon gamma is a signal of a T helper one adaptive immunity and has been also associated with anti-tumor um, response. So this study was nice in that it showed that the GIST immune microenvironment can be manipulated. So the next is immune checkpoint blockade. And immune checkpoint inhibition um, has really become uh, so important in the management of various cancer types and has been FDA approved in, in a variety of cancer uh, cancers to date. Essentially, the immune system has various checkpoints that prevent the immune system going into uh, excess, causing excess inflammation within the body, such that trying to prevent the immune system um, targeting normal tissue and preventing an autoimmune uh, disorder. So there are various checkpoints that can be blocked, which then release that inhibition on the immune system. And these include PD-1 and CTLA-4, for, for example. And so there's been two studies so far um, looking at nivolumab with or without ipilimumab in advanced GIST. Nivolumab is an anti-PD-1 therapy. Ipilimumab is an anti-CTLA-4 therapy. In the two studies, we really didn't see great response. There was one case in Arun Singh's um, study of in the combination arm where we saw a, um, a, com a complete response, in fact. The median progression free survival for the combination arm was better than the single and um, monotherapy arm at around three months. And this was also seen in the second study, the Alliance, which had an expansion cohort in GIST. But we do see, and there have been published um, case reports where we do see good durable control from immune checkpoint to blockade. And this is an example published by Seth Pollock and his group. Um, and this was in a case of a wild type gist. And similarly, I've had that experience in my practice as well. So the next phase of, of research in this area has really been immune checkpoint blockade in combination with other therapies. So first, the immune checkpoint blockade in combination with chemotherapy. And we have a study from the French group looking at metronomics like phosphamide with pembrolizumab. This study included around 10 um, patients with GIST. Um, the, in the overall group, or in the GIST group alone, the six-month progression-free rate, uh, progression-free survival rate was about 11%, and the median progression-free survival was 1.4, so not very good activity. And the great thing about this study was that the correlative work that they um, performed, again, they saw high levels of ID1 expression in the immune cells following treatment in the GIST, in the GIST population. So 63% of immune cells, mainly macrophages, expressed IDO1. So suggesting that IDO1, again, is potentially um, a mechanism, the IDO1 pathway is potentially a mechanism of resistance to immune checkpoint inhibition in GIST. And that led to a clinical trial of pembrolizumab in combination with epicatastat, which is an ID1 inhibitor. Um, this study, the results have not been uh, reported, and I'm not certain, I'm not aware of whether this study fully finished. Unfortunately, this combination was shown not to be effective in a large phase three study in melanoma, and the program pretty much shut down. So I'm not certain what and um, how many patients ultimately went on this study um, that we may be able to gain data from. The next is immune checkpoint inhibition in combination with tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And the tyrosine kinase inhibitors that we use, many of them also suppress VEGF. And VEGF is um, a, a mediator of tumor immune escape. Um, it causes a defect in the functional maturation of dendritic cells and antigen pre presenting cells from progenitors. And essentially it's a key factor produced by solid tumors to uh, inhibit their recognition and their destruction by the immune system. There's also another theory called the normalization hypothesis that essentially tyrosine kinase inhibitors that suppress VEGF um, ultimately are trying to improve and reduce angiogenesis and new vessel formation within the tumor. And by doing so, will actually somewhat improve blood, fl blood flow to the tumor and ultimately oxygenation that may improve and produce an immune stimulatory um, microenvironment within the tumor. So many studies are 
ongoing and looking at this, and one that was published is that um, of a imatinib or a disatinib in combination with ipilimumab, a CTLA-4 um, blockade um, agent. And in this study, unfortunately, we, again, we didn't really see any responses, and the median PFS was about 2.8 months. Overall, it was felt that disatinib probably wasn't the best choice of tyrosine kinase inhibitor because from the earlier preclinical data that I showed, um, we need to see um, effective kit inhibition in order to kind of uh, stimulate that immune stimulatory response in GIST. The other trials that are ongoing in this area are many, and we look forward to seeing the results that they will provide, and in particular, the correlative of data that they will share that will hopefully inform future design of IO studies in the future. So going back to our other potential um, IO strategies and just the other more novel approaches, one is looking at um, an antibody drug um, conjugate therapy um, against KIT. And there was a compound LOP628 that was studied in preclinical um, uh, solid tumors showing good activity um, in GIST in both imatinib sensitive and refractory GIST um, samples. Um, and interestingly, the antibody alone was not effective inducing a response. It was only when it was conjugated with the chemotherapy agent that we saw a response. However, in the subsequent phase one study, um, three patients experienced a rapid hypersensitivity reaction to this therapy. And it was shown that mast cell degranulation was the reason for this. And this is because KIT is also a marker expressed on a variety of um, hematopoietic progenitor and stem cells as well. So I think until we can um, identify something that's truly specific only to the GIST tumor cell or can direct it just to the tumor, this type of treatment will be, will be challenging. So next we have a bispecific antibody therapy that is targeting somatostatin receptor two and also CD3. And this is an agonist of both of those trying to stimulate the T cell infiltrate within the tumor and then stimulate the activity of the somatostatin receptor two, which when joined by somatostatin, um, it results in an antiproliferative um, activity by inhibition of the MAP kinase and PI3 kinase pathways. And there's a study, um, a phase one study of an agent um, looking at this um, that has already accrued fully. Um, we're waiting for the results. And this was um, reasonable to um, utilize in GIST because we know that the expression of somatostatin receptor 2 is relatively high in GIST at about approximately 87%. And then that brings me to the final um, pathway that um, is a potential novel approach, and that is a, a CAR T cell therapy, whereby we genetically engineer T cells to recognize a cell surface marker on a GIST tumor cell, such as KIT. Um, this has been shown to be effective in a preclinical GIST model um, and also in a, a hematological setting. But again, I worry that the fact that KIT is not just specific to the tumor itself and also expressed on other important cells within the body, this will be a challenging um, avenue to explore. So in summary, GIST has an immunosuppressive immune microenvironment. There are many ways to harness um, uh, the immune landscape to potentially treat GIST. It's likely that we will need combination approaches with a view to converting the immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment towards an immune stimulated one. And there are several IO studies um, ongoing and I welcome and look forward to seeing the data that they will share and bring uh, to us uh, in order to help us design future trials in, 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 the, in the coming future. And with that, I'll leave this little picture um, and um, be, I will welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Dr. Kelly, for exploring the many avenues being looked at now in uh, immuno-oncology. Immuno um, I think I, rather than move to questions right away, I think maybe we'll proceed with the other with the other presentations, would that be okay, Sarah? And then we'll take questions all together at the end. Uh, okay, thanks very much. So um, thank you, and now we'll move on to uh, Dr. Suzanne George, please. I needed to unmute.
Great. All right, hopefully you can see my slides okay. All right. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for the opportunity to come and speak today. Um, just by looking at the Zoom rooms, I see some familiar faces and um, really do wish that we could be in person and hope that that will, will happen again in the not so distant future. So I also recognize that there could be a fair bit of variability in the audience with regard to where you are in your journey with GIST. And so I have actually um, framed my comments more towards perhaps people that have had less experience with the disease. And so some of this may be repetitive for some of you, but I hope that it at least builds somewhat of a framework for people that uh, maybe that have been in, in this longer, but also for some that are relatively new to the, to the disease and to the entity. So what I'm talking about today, what I decided to talk about was I wanted to highlight some results from recent phase one trials in GIST and think about how that impacts future directions. And the reason that I wanted to do this is because in my clinical practice, I find that one of the most common things that people ask about are clinical trials. And when we start to talk about clinical trials, we talk about the different phases of clinical trials, phase one, phase two, phase three. And one of the, and I find that we spend a lot of time, either a lot of time or very little time talking about phase one, because I think that phase one trials are uh, people come to the table with different perceptions and understandings about them. And I wanted to take some time just to kind of give you my perspective about phase one trials and also how they've impacted GIST and how they likely will continue to do so. So what are phase one trials? Phase one trials are typically first in human trials. They may be the first time that a drug has actually been taken by a person. Um, they have the goal of determining the optimal dose of the study of the, of the drug. So if we're just starting to use a, tri a drug in person, we need a, a, a space in which to understand and learn what is the right dose to use. Um, the, the trials also work to define, oops, sorry, to determine the side effects of the drug. Again, this is new that we're just starting to use these and we wanna understand what's the dose, how does it affect people? They also, however, we also will use a term called a phase 1B trial. A phase 1B trial will often combine, use, be the first time that two drugs that have already been in practice are now being used together for the first time. And the goals are still the same, where we're defining the optimal dose of how you combine things, and we're learning what the side effects are. Phase 1 trials over the last several years have been increasingly novel in their design, for two ways. One is that in contrast to historical phase one trials back in the day of early cancer therapeutic development, when we would just use drugs that were new that we thought would kill cells in the most general way, we would use them in cancer patients in the most general way. That isn't really what phase one trials are like now. The principles are the same. It's optimal dose determination and it's side effect and toxicity determination, but it's right from the beginning using rationally designed therapeutics, typically in a population that we think that they're most likely to be effective. So that although efficacy signals, meaning how, what percentage of people does this work in, is not necessarily what's called the primary endpoint or the first endpoint on the list of things we're trying to accomplish in a phase one. It's a very important endpoint that's increasingly integrated into our phase one studies. Because of this, what you'll see in many phase one studies now that are built on this rational therapeutic strategy is that phase one studies will have very large expansion cohorts. And what that means is that once the do optimal dose is determined, Right within that phase one, there may be an intentional uh, group of people, tar um, uh, cohort of people that are uh, potentially eligible to further explore the side effects in a bigger way, but it's to also get a sense of signals of benefit. And that's what this phase one trial did with avapritinib. So avapritinib, which I know that you all talked about yesterday, 
um, is a very selective, potent um, tyrosine kinase inhibitor that was designed to be very active against a specific rare mutation in GIST called Peter Jeff receptor alpha D842V that previously was refractory to currently approved therapies. Avapritinib also hits kit exon 17, which is a common imatinib resistance mutation, but really the drug is exceedingly potent against this D842V uh, mutation. And what this um, waterfall plot shows from the phase one study, again, this is a phase one study. I'm not sure if you're familiar, so I apologize if this is repetitive for some, but this is a, what we call a waterfall plot. And each bar on the waterfall plot, oops, sorry. Each bar on the waterfall plot represents an individual study participant and how much of this uh, tumor burden reduced over time or increased. And for avapritinib, you can see that in this molecularly sub subset population that nearly all patients enrolled had tumor reduction. The one patient with tumor increase actually didn't have a D842B mutation, they had a D842 other mutation. So this experience in this phase one was cumulatively the largest experience of patients with this subtype of disease. The, this um, represents, this benefit uh, waterfall plot represents several different dose levels. So not all patients uh, shown here actually received the same dose. Some of them received a lower dose in the escalation portion of the trial, um, again, because it was a phase one. But this study also went on to expand various kit mutant expansion cohorts and ended up enrolling close to 250 patients in a phase one to really get that sense of safety, toxicity risks, toxicity signals, and these efficacy signals. And together, this phase one trial led to the drug approval of avapritinib in this molecular subset of GIST. And I raise this because again, I think phase ones are built differently. They're not all the same, but in a molecularly rationally designed trial, one can learn a lot from a phase one trial. Let's see. This, oh my goodness, my slides are all out of order. Hold on. Here we go. Sorry about that. This slide summarizes a phase one trial that was happening at the same time that the avapritinib study was happening. And this was happening with repretinib, which has since been approved and is known by the commercial name of Kinlock. Again, three major expansion cohorts, there are actually more, but I'm gonna focus on these three expansion cohorts within the phase one trial of repretinib. These are the waterfall plots. The top box is patients that had only received imatinib going into the study. And as you can see, some patients, it wasn't the right fit and the tumor grew. But for other patients, there was disease stabilization and shrinkage. This experience led to the phase three trial comparing repretinib to sunitinib, which is accrued and expected to report out later this year. The middle panel is the, is the waterfall plot for patients that have received at least two priors. So imatinib and sunitinib and this in repretinib was their third line. Again, for some people, it wasn't the right fit. For others, it did show benefit. And the bottom panel are patients who received repretinib in the study for it, who had received at least four, at least three prior. So this is fourth line or beyond. And this is a space that there was previously no approved therapies. And as you can see from this phase one experience, there was an obvious signal of efficacy of benefit. Again, many patients on the negative side of the waterfall, things going down. That led to a phase three trial, which ultimately led to the drug approval. So rational drug development to me, especially starting from phase one, is bringing the right drug that hits the right target to the right population. And we can see signals very early on. And I think that this is really improving the efficiencies of our drug development. <clears throat> I also think that in GIST, we have a great opportunity where um, 
because we understand, we don't understand everything, but we have a good understanding of the foundational biology of the disease that we can bring kit inhibitors early on in drug development, treat patients early on to begin to identify those signals. Design, uh, phase one studies can also include secondary questions that provide important information. And this was done very much in the Repretinib study where they looked at intrapatient dose escalation, or they looked at patients staying on study after progression to see if this helped to benefit patients. And that was, this paper's been published, which this is, um, this is called a swimmer's plot where each, each horizontal bar now represents an individual patient. And this summarizes the patient experience on drug, time on drug, either by the light bluish gray when the patients were at 150 milligrams a day, or the gold bar, which is after they had been dose escalated to twice a day. And when taking this data together, the, the median progression-free survival, so the median time to progression, so growth of at least 30% or development of new lesions on the low dose was about five months. And on the higher dose, looking at the same patients that had a dose increase was again, just under five months. So suggesting that there was similar benefit to disease control after dose escalation. We'll never know for sure if it was a dose escalation or if it's just remaining on the same drug, but it does raise an interesting question about benefit beyond progression with, with this particular agent. So all currently approved treatments for GIST are, are inhibitors of KIT. And I'm sure you've talked about this in the last couple of days. So imatinib first line, sunitinib second line, regorafenib third line, repretinib fourth line, and avapritinib for the unique molecular subset of Peter Jeffrey receptor alpha D842V mutant patient, GIST. But I think really where we're gonna start looking, and I think this builds on what Dr. Kelly says, is is there a way to build on the benefits seen with KIT inhibitors by combining other drugs with them with unique mechanisms of action? This is a phase one study that was um, presented at ASCO this year. So the American so uh, Society of Clinical Oncology meeting this year, this was led by Cesar Serrano, who's at the Valdebron in, in Barcelona. And this is a unique study that combined imatinib as sort of the kit inhibitor backbone with selenexor, which is a novel compound. It's a selective inhibitor of nuclear export. The thought is that it basically keeps important proteins in the cell that allows the cell to go on to cell death. And um, what you can see is that there were three dose levels as would be standard for a phase one and patients were then followed. Important in this study is that everybody enrolled in this study had already had a matinib and progressed on it. So this is trying to salvage a treatment that is previous, that the disease has already figured out how to get around. And I think what was interesting is that the authors reported that there were two patients, as is um, shown here in these yellow diamond shapes, who actually went on to have significant tumor shrinkage. And some patients who were able to, re who remained on study for more than six months, and some two of those who are actually continuing at the time of publication. So it really raises that it raises an interest. I think this is hypothesis generating. I don't think it's as much of a as much of a signal as we saw in some of the earlier studies that I showed, but it certainly begins to wonder whether this may be an opportunity to learn more. And the authors are continuing to explore this. A similar study that's actually really very much a similar concept that's been very much um, put forth by uh, Ping Chi, who's also at Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, has looked strongly at, has looked very much at combining something called a MEK inhibitor with a KIT inhibitor based on preclinical rationale that she published several, her group published several years ago. Just explaining this, this here, this is a, this is a, a xenograft, so a mouth, mouse model where GIST cells were implanted into the mouse, a tumor grew, they treated it with a variety of different things and then mapped how it changed over time. The blue and the red line demonstrate with those agents. So vehicle is basically like a placebo. The MEK inhibitor is just the MEK inhibitor alone. The tumor kept getting bigger. This is an imatinib sensitive model. So the green line represents imatinib alone and the tumor kind of stayed flat. It didn't really grow, but it didn't really shrink. And then when using it, 
in using these two drugs in combination, the tumor actually began to shrink. So uh, Dr. Chi and colleagues moved this into patients, and this was presented at ASCO 2020, so about a year and a half ago, virtual meeting. And this is a combination of imatinib plus the MEK inhibitor called binimetinib. And as you can see here, very impressive waterfall plot. Everything's going down, except for just a couple, oops, sorry, except for just a couple of people. But what we know one of the, and I think this is very exciting. It's really bringing proof of principle from the from the from the bench to the bedside. One of the things that, in, in my mind, makes this a little bit uh, raises a question of how we have to continue to study this and learn how to apply it, is that all the patients enrolled on this study had never had prior Gleevec, and we know or imatinib, sorry, and we know that imatinib is very effective as a single agent. So this certainly is encouraging, but needs further follow-up. And there's an, a soon to start phase one study with the combination of binimetinib and repretinib in GIST. It's just got posted on clinicaltrials.gov last, uh, on Monday. <laughs> I just happened to discover it. So um, um, it'll be open, it looks like it'll be open both uh, in Europe and at the, in the several centers in the US. So I know I'm running out of time, but I'll just say briefly that to follow up on what Chiara was talking about, about antibody drug conjugates, I think this is a really novel opportunity for GIST. We just need to find the right protein target to, to bring, to carry the toxin into the cell. GPR20 is a unique protein that we've, our group has recently published on that may be such a target. And there's an ongoing phase one trial currently halted for data analysis that is, um, hopefully we'll be able to explore that a bit more. I won't go into this too much for time. So in summary, I think phase one trials are tremendously important. They really focus on the trans rational translation of science from the bench to the bedside. And flexible study designs allow expansion cohorts when exploring safety and efficacy signals, particularly in rare tumor populations or subpopulations that have a very strong biologic rationale for the therapy being explored. Future trials, I think, are very much going to start focusing and continue to focus on combinations of kit inhibitors and other compounds, as well as novel kit inhibitors to continue to build on the successes we've seen in GIST with kit-directed therapies. Ultimately, this is not an ad to participate in phase one trials, but just really to help people understand what phase one trials are and, and the changes that they've been able to bring to the field. The ultimate decision to participate is certainly an individual choice. So thank you so much. I will stop my share and thanks for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. George. That was fascinating. And uh, it's nice to see how today's talks are tying into the uh, previous talks we've had in the meeting. And uh, I'd like to encourage uh, participants if they have questions to put them into the chat. Uh, we're actually right on time, perfectly on time. So we're gonna move on to Dr. Vincenzi next and then uh, at 10 o'clock, we'll have, we'll move into the unmet research needs discussion. And I believe that all of the uh, doctors have been kind enough to agree to stay on through that session. So we can take uh, questions for any of the doctors uh, during that 10 o'clock session. So we'll, we'll carry on now. Thank you, uh, Dr. Vincenzi, you'll, you'll be on next. Thank you. So first of all, thank you for inviting me. Really, really, really happy to to share my, um, the, the, my research activities in my center uh, and happy to, to present this data after Dr. Kelly and Dr. George. Uh, okay. okay, actually we have, I'm focusing on the research lines in my institution, but it is interesting because, uh, because a couple of them are uh, have been very recently published. Uh, we have two current lines of clinical research. One, uh, the first one is focused on the different doses of uh, imatinib given as an adjuvant treatment in X9 mutated GIST. Uh, the second one is still focused on the adjuvant treatment with imatinib and it's focused on uh, uh, quite uh, um, not very well studied um, side effect. It is about bone density and sarcopenia. And uh, finally, we have a couple of research lines based on translational research, 
there's some, some atomic differences between GIST with different driver mutations and some uh, patient derived cell lines with rare kit mutations. The, the last two research lines are very at a very early stage and I cannot share anything of interest for you. And the opposite, uh, I think that uh, can be of useful to share the data of the two uh, clinical research, uh, research lines. While we are focusing on the X9 mutated GIS patients, uh, um, because the X9 is quite rare, can characterize um, quite different uh, um, GIST uh, behavior in comparison with the more common X11 mutated GIST. Uh, X9 mutated GIST are more commonly observed in the small intestine. Also, the clinical behavior can be different with more common peritoneal diffusion rather, th rather than liver metastasis. Um, and probably the most relevant thing is that uh, the benefit uh, uh, associated with imatinib treatment, mostly in the adjuvant treatment and but also in the metastatic setting, is uh, uh, less, than, uh, less than the other mutation. In particular, if we compare the activity of imatinib uh, with the X11 mutated GIS. We have data from a couple of uh, different trials in the adjuvant setting. The first one is the, um, uh, this trial uh, published a few, few years ago that support uh, oops, that the, the X9 uh, mutated GIS uh, um, can have a uh, um, um, later relapse uh, after surgery, but the, the uh, benefit uh, associated with the treatment with malinib with the standard dose of 400 milligrams uh, is uh, very, very low, or uh, we can define also unrelevant. The same results uh, have been um, uh, demonstrated, have, have been published later, uh, in this trial, uh, where no statistically significant difference in terms of relapse free survival was observed in the specific population of the kit, um, X9 mutated kit GIS, even if the, the numbers are very, very low, uh, the, the authors concluded that X9 seems to have better outcome than uh, GIS patients with X11, but no benefit of, from the, the um, adjuvant imatinib. These results can be, can be associated with uh, many different explanation. Uh, the more uh, um, plausible is that probably patients with X9 mutations can benefit of higher dose of, uh, of imatinib. These data were also uh, demonstrated in metastatic setting by a quite old trial published as the MetaGIS trial. Um, where the authors, uh, uh, by combining two different phase three clinical trials, demonstrated that higher dose of imatinib seems to be more effective uh, in exonamidated GIS in comparison with the standard dose. Uh, on this basis, uh, uh, some uh, um, um, physicians de decided to offer higher dose uh, of imatinib uh, in exonamidated GIS, even if uh, uh, um, scientific demonstration uh, of um, clinical uh, higher activity of higher doses are lacking. On the basis uh, 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 of this background, we decided to run a retrospective analysis that was published uh, last month on the clinical cancer research. It was um, a big effort involving uh, 20, 23 specialist GIS centers in Europe uh, uh, across eight different European countries. Most of the more expert centers uh, um, were involved uh, and contributed to the final data set. Uh, at the end of the story, we uh, collected about 200, 185 uh, patients. Um, uh, obviously, the retrospective nature of the, this analysis represented a big bias, but another big bias was represented by the, the 
uh, physician selection biases because obviously uh, according to the prognostic factor physicians were more uh, 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 given higher dose of imatinib but if the prognostic factor were uh, more negative so uh, obviously there were the we detected an imbalance between uh, the two doses of imatinib uh, in terms of prognostic factors. This was a big uh, limitation uh, and we were concerned but, and for these reasons, we decided to use some sp statistical tools, uh, uh, the propensity score matching and inverse probability of treatment weakening to mitigate uh, the baseline differences uh, and the um, um, associated uh, biases. Uh, we decided to study um, four main uh, survival outcomes, the lapse free survival, obviously, in the intended dose population. Uh, it is very similar by definition to the intention to treat population. They modified the lapse free survival from the end of the RD1 treatment to relapse. They imagined failure free survival and obviously overall survival. Uh, this Picture depicted the relapse free survival, uh, survival cures, but uh, in uh, all the similar results were observed for all the different survival outcomes, and no uh, significant uh, uh, benefit was observed uh, in the higher dose uh, um, imatinib treatment. At the opposite, some um, uh, difference, uh, even if not statistically significant, was observed in favor of the lower dose. This is quite strange to be explained, but probably could be related to some um, receptor modification that by pharmacokinetic point of view can be uh, quite easy to be explained. And it's, it is the same that in the metastatic setting uh, uh, was, can, can explain an higher activity of the higher dose. Uh, when correcting for baseline characteristic, no differences in survival outcomes between the two uh, doses with the higher high methodic index and the non gastric site that were consistently associated with our worst outcomes, confirming what we already observed in, uh, in uh, uh, previous studies. Obviously, this trial uh, needs to be uh, further val validated to be definitive, or probably uh, uh, um, an additional prospective trial should be run. But of course, it, it is limited by the extraordinary uh, rarity of, uh, uh, of the entity. Remaining into the uh, um, adjuvant setting, I wish to share with you this other data, not yet published, but um, actually under review, that is um, focused on the bone density and sarcopenia in uh, this patient treated with the in the, uh, as adjuvant uh, in the adjuvant setting. The background is represented by the fact that imatinib uh, uh, target CKIT and PGFR, of course, but also uh, some other tyrosine kinase um, um, receptor, such as the macrophage coloring stimulating factor. And uh, on this basis, imatinib can influence muscle composition and uh, also the bone health. Uh, so our hypothesis is that imatinib in the adjuvant setting may have a role on mineral, bone mineral density. These data were already explored uh, in uh, patients with chronic myeloid leukemia treated with imatinib, but also on muscle composition. And these two modifications, mostly on the muscle composition, can be associated with imatinib-related toxicity. We retrospectively select, selected patients treated in uh, our center with high risk GIST that completed three years of adjuvant treatment with, with imatinib. And we identified also a control group, uh, age and gender matched, to compare the modification mostly in terms of uh, bone density. Both muscle and bone density were evaluated on a CT scan at 6, 12, and 18 months. Uh, considering the very strict uh, um, inclusion criteria, uh, at the end, we identified only 14 patients uh, and compared with the comp control groups. Obviously, um, as we can expect, uh, men had a significantly higher bone mineral density comparison with women, 
uh, and also in terms of smart, uh, smooth muscle index and limbo mass, mass, there was a difference in favor of men in comparison with women. Um, it is interesting that during the treatment, bone mineral and density showed a significant increase over time. This is absolutely the opposite uh, uh, with other treatments such as other tyrosinase inhibitors and chemotherapy in other uh, cancer uh, conditions. And uh, it is of interest that in patients with the basal level, uh, with a lower basal level of BMD, BMD showed a significant increase over different time points higher than the other population with a normal BMD. Um, in association with these findings, we observed that in, uh, the opposite. In patients with a lower BMI and a lower low MB, an higher rate of grade three adverse event was detected. This is not surprising, considering that imatinib uh, can have a volume of distribution into the muscle and the lean bone mass. So it is not surprising that in patients with a lower BMI, we can expect higher, uh, an higher rate of higher toxicities. So in conclusion, we have analyzed for the first time the impact of imatinib uh, on BMI and also in uh, um, uh, BMI and the LMB that uh, uh, discovering that BM BMD can be associated with an increase of BMD uh, during treatment with imatinib and that low BMI mostly can is associated with an higher rate of rate three toxicities associated with the body in the adjuvant setting. And finally, this is something that we are exploring in the last months. Uh, we are trying to uh, go into the mechanism of imatinib resistance uh, um, uh, in GS treated with imatinib. We, all know, we know that me mechanism of imatinib resistance are multiple, mostly associated with secondary kit mutation. But very recent evidences uh, support that also an overexpression of the cycling D1 can uh, have a role. On the basis of this hypothesis, we decided to explore also the role of uh, CDK4 inhibitors that can be associated with a reduction of the combination of cycling D1 and CDK4 and C complex that uh, uh, um, at the end of the story are associated with an addition of the retinoblastoma phosphorylation and pathway. So the hypothesis is that the GIST cells during the treatment with imatinib can have an increase of cycling D1 expression that uh, continuing imatinib treatment can be associated with an expansion of imatinib resistance tumor cells. Uh, given concomitantly or sequentially after the development of resistance uh, uh, of some CDK4 inhibitors, uh, the hypothesis is that we could reduce the spread of imatinib-resistant tumor cells and also the inhibition of tumor cells progression. So actually what we are trying to do in our lab is the exploration of um, uh, CDK4 inhibitors, the three actually available, pulbosiclib, ribosiclib, and abimacitib that are very well demonstrated that are inactive given as a single agent uh, in this patient according to the data published by the French group. But we are trying to explore in the cell lines who develop secondary resistance. So finally, I wish to uh, deeply express my personal gratitude to the Italian Association of GIST patients for the continuous support in terms of research first, but also in terms of teaching activities in, in Italy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Vincenzi. I think it's been great to see this. Uh, we've really seen this morning the diversity of approaches that are being taken in uh, clinical research with regard to GIST therapy. It's really very exciting. Um, we have a few minutes remaining before we uh, move on to the unmet research needs. So I would um, encourage anyone who has questions in the audience to put them into the chat. And I know we have one already. Uh, it's from Martin Wettstein, and uh, it's addressed to Dr. George, but it, I, I think I could probably generalize it to uh, to uh, the other
panel members as well in terms of their own research. So uh, Dr. West, um, <laughs> Barton Westing asks Dr. George, do we know anything about side effects from the from the combined treatments with Selinexor and the MEK inhibitors? So uh, maybe a more general way to put that question is when we move to these combination treatments, uh, what's the imp implication for side effects? So I'll turn that back to the panel and maybe uh, Dr. George, you'd like to lead that off? Oh, sure. No, it's, it's a really important question. Um, certainly when we use two drugs, then we are at risk for two sets of toxicities. And depending on how the drugs work together, if they have overlapping toxicities or side effects, then those side effects can be heightened when you use them together. And that sometimes builds into what dose we end up. Specifically with regard to the Selenexor study, the primary toxicity that they had at the higher, that that third dose level was nausea and vomiting, which is a real problem with Selenexor as a single agent. Um, and uh, that's something that's being, that, that can be a real challenge. So it's act, even though the, the, um, some of the benefit was seen at the highest dose combination. The recommended dose, if, if the study, if the combination moves forward is actually one dose level down because of the GI toxicity. Would any of the other panel members like to uh, comment? I see Pete Knox has his hand up. Pete, do you have a question? Yeah, a question. Just let them comment if they want to first. I can comment a little bit about the MEC uh, inhibitor in combination with the Matnab study. Um, I saw a number of patients on that trial and a number of my own patients were on that trial. And it definitely, the addition of the MEC inhibitor to a Matnab definitely exacerbates um, the side effects that we see with the Matnab in general. So fluid retention, skin toxicity, rashes. But I can say that definitely with managing good management of those side effects in a supportive way, um, the, the side effects are definitely manageable in a long-term fashion. Um, so in, in fact, in terms of the phase one study that was done, the recommended phase two dose actually was slightly higher than what we actually subsequently used to help with mitigating toxicity, um, side issues with toxicity. So definitely um, there, it takes a little bit of time to find that balance of what's going to work for the patient and from a side effect perspective, but it's definitely manageable. Thank you. Um, Pete, so, you yeah, so first off, great presentations, folks, on some very challenging topics. So kudos to all of you. I actually had a question uh, for Dr. Kelly. I saw the mention of the cytokine therapy, particularly the peg interferon and a matinib combo. And I agree that that's interesting because it, it does show proof of concept about manipulation of the immune environment. But there were only eight patients in the study. So do you know of any plans to either expand that study or any other cytokine based therapy maybe you want to talk about that's ongoing and obviously the other members of the panel can comment on that as well. Um, so I'm actually, so that study was from 2012 and I'm sure there was hope to, to expand it at that time, but obviously nothing has come up since then. I'm not aware, I'm not involved in anything myself with respect to cytokine based therapy, but I think um, there are a lot of novel agents out there and being developed that I would be surprised if we don't consider that, you know, in the future. Maybe any of the other uh, speakers can comment further as well. No, I, I agree. I agree with what you said, Kiara. I'm not, I'm not aware of cytokine specific therapy happening in just right now. Okay, thank you. I have, uh, we have a number of other questions uh, coming in, and I'll just read one of them here from Saeed. Saeed says, I'm using Humira, Humira, a TNF inhibitor, as well as imatinib, 400 milligrams. Can Humira have a positive or negative effect on tumor growth? I'll toss that one out to, to the experts. I think that answer is that we probably don't know. Uh, we have never studied the two of them together. Um, so uh, the purpose of the, it's a challenging one because I guess the Humira is there to help treat an autoimmune condition, potentially something like inflammatory bowel disease perhaps, um, whereby you're trying to dampen the immune response within the body. So 
But whether it would have a negative or a positive effect, truly, we don't know unless we studied it further, I feel. Yes, I agree. It's really hard. And I think that we, for an individual, it's always a balance of what's the right mix of treatments for what somebody needs as, as, as a human, you know, it's, you have to do what's right for all of your, all of the health issues that you have. I will comment as well. And, um, you know, when we're using these immunotherapy agents, um, I will preface and say, obviously immunotherapy is investigational in gist. And I guess what my presentation was really to be trying to like hypothesis generating and just showing what research is ongoing and how we're thinking. But um, like Suzanne said, you have to be very um, uh, mindful of everything that a patient is uh, experiencing and the conditions that they have. But I will say when we use immunotherapy, I also treat a different type of cancer Merkel cell where immunotherapy is the predominant treatment for that disease. And there are patients who also have autoimmune conditions that are on potentially steroids or other immunosuppressant therapy. And just because they have that history in trials, they're often excluded from involvement. But we are with greater knowledge of using these age, immunotherapy agents in cancer. Um, we are adding to that body of literature and there are patients who have those conditions where we are treating with immunotherapy, but you do so in a very kind of controlled fashion, making sure the other person, the other uh, doctors that are helping to treat the autoimmune uh, disease are on board and you work together um, managing the patient in, in that way. So there's, you know, it's definitely a balance as Suzanne explained. I think that the, probably the daily clinical experience learned us that the, the vast majority of patients uh, receive a lot of concomitant medications. Uh, the anti-TNF is, is one of them. So probably one of, probably the main concern is not related to the efficacy of the treatment rather than the potential overlapping toxicities of, of the drugs. But it is just an example because it is true for many other different uh, uh, for many different uh, uh, concomitant drugs, so not only the um, uh, immunoactives. Thank you. So I wanted to turn now to a question that's actually coming in from more than one participant. Um, and this is with regard to the effect of imatinib on bone health. And uh, so the question is, uh, since people are now taking uh, imatinib for many years, what does a long-term imatinib patient need to be concerned about in terms of managing bone health? I'll put that out to all the doctors. Yeah. Uh, well, what we observe is that just after one year, mostly in patients with a uh, low bone mineral density at the beginning, uh, the baseline, we may observe an increase of bone density. This is something that was already demonstrated in CML, exactly at the same time point. Anyone else want to comment on that? Can I ask, uh, Bruno, did, um, did you see, did you look at, I mean, it may have been very difficult to do so, but like look at maybe skeletal events or anything within the populations? <laughs> No, 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 but, uh, but the, the, these patients were all adjuvant patients in the adjuvant setting. So uh, we did not observe any skeletal event in, the very, in this very small population, but we, are, uh, we plan to give a look to the meta, in the metastatic setting, uh, obviously because the duration of imatinib treatment is longer. Uh, but it is something of interest. Actually, we are exploring the circulating biomarkers of bone, bone, bone health, such as CT, CTX, NTX, and so on. So it is a nice uh, area of investigation, honestly. It is up, up, definitively unexpected. Yeah, no, it's, and I'd love to know what happens for patients who stop imatinib and what happens their bone health in that setting it's fascinating. Yeah. 
Thanks. And there are a number of other questions coming up with regard to bone health. So I think we can look at this as an emerging topic of interest to uh, both the patients and the doctors. Um, in view of the time, I'm going to move on to one final question from the audience, and then we'll, we'll move into the uh, research needs questions. So uh, Catherine asks about, and this is a question that I think I've seen come up quite frequently. What about management of nausea? And in particular, uh, PPIs, drugs like Nexium, which I know are very widely prescribed along with other drugs. So uh, I was told, uh, Catherine asks, I was told that PPIs like Nexium can affect the efficacy of, of Gleevec. And I wondered if the, any of the doctors could comment on uh, the use of PPIs along with Gleevec. You know, there's, I think that there's a lot of um, data that's emerged that long-term acid suppression, independent of being on Gleevec or having just is, is, is not great for people if, if it can be avoided. That's, it's actually another issue related to bone health and absorption and things like that. So we try to um, see if it's, if people can tolerate not being on PPIs for many reasons. Um, but some people, it's just what they tolerate. It's what they need in order to be on their drug. And so if people need to be on a PPI or, you know, at some chronic acid suppression in order to tolerate either their prior surgery or <clears throat> the drug, then some people need to be on them. But generally we're trying to help people to not need them if possible. Not so much because I'm worried about the interaction with Gleevec, but or imatinib, not so much because I'm worried about imatinib interaction, but more because I think it's more around sort of long-term side effects of BPI use. Thank I don't you. know how others practice, but. I agree on that, totally. It, it, it is the same uh, attitude we try to follow to to exclude PPI as a standard chronic treatment in, uh, in our patient on the basis of the data published on, on other TKIs, but probably the, the, the effect is definitely overlapping also for Madrid. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good point. I mean, there's much clearer data around drugs like pezopenib, for example, where the gastric pH makes a much bigger difference on absorption. I don't think that data exists to the same extent with imatinib. Um, but other some other drugs, it makes a really big difference on how well the drug is absorbed. I think for some people, as you all know, you're living with this disease. The nausea can be really challenging. It's low level and chronic. I just wouldn't underestimate the importance of eating, about taking imatinib on a full stomach. Um, it really, it's, it's, I think it's probably the best way to manage imatinib-associated nausea. Um, but if despite having it, the, taking the drug on a full stomach, there's still chronic nausea present. Sometimes we have people take anti-nausea medicine chronically 30 minutes before they take their matinib if needed. Thank you very much. Those are some important practical uh, questions and advice. Much appreciated. So uh, we're now going to move on. Uh, there are still a few more questions in the chat, but we can catch up with those later, um, maybe after the uh, meeting. So let me move on now to our next final part of this morning's, uh, the first session this morning, and that's the topic of how do we address unmet research needs. And uh, I'd like to begin that by asking the following question, which uh, each and all of the panel members might uh, like to respond to in terms of where we can go next. So we all know that GIST research relies on a lot of specialized tools. We've heard about some of them during the meeting, uh, specific drugs, specific inhibitors, antibodies, cell lines, animal models, other assays. So suppose I had a magic wand and I could grant you one new, grant each of you one new research tool, uh, one new tool to use in your research. What would you ask for? What, what do you most need? So I'll toss that question out to each of the uh, panel members, please. Uh, and you can go in order. I'll start with Dr. Kelly. 
So thank you, David. This is not an easy question to answer. <laughs> um, I don't think there's just one thing. Um, I think I've only though, got one magic wand. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest something that's not actually in your list, and uh, it's collaboration. I think that's the key to success in research, particularly with a rare. Uh, tumor and I think uh, all the studies that we've highlighted or many that Suzanne and Bruno have highlighted happen through collaboration and I think that is the key. Uh, an international database of just patients that we could utilize would be ideal um, and maybe that's something to strive for. Yes and that's certainly something that the uh, Life Raft group is very involved in. Great. Um, turn, turn to Dr. George. Yeah, actually, my thoughts were very similar to Dr. Kelly's. I, I actually, I think if you could do one thing, or your magic wand could do one thing, it would be to break down the uh, regulatory barriers internationally, to make it easier to collaborate between countries. Um, that's sometimes such a such a tricky, so tricky. Every country has their own regulatory rules that can really get in the way of um, a lot of practical aspects of clinical trial execution, for example. And while you're doing that, if you could create a model that was truly completely re <laughs> reflective of the human gist experience, that would be great too. Yeah, I was wondering about that. An, an animal model that was truly, yeah. Uh, I think that's an important question. Maybe I'd like to, I'd like to comment on the, the relevance of these uh, tumor xenograft models, for example. I mean, how well do they really uh, pre reflect or model the human patient experience? I think it's very important. I, I think a lot, I actually think a lot of them do. The, the thing about GIST is because we really can focus on the specific kit. We have a, a good understanding of primary oncogenic drivers, like what's driving the tumor. We have a good understanding of resistance mechanisms, at least in the kit, kit associated, you know, secondary resistance mutations. These models grow well in mice. I think we have a good handle on that. But at the end of the day, the way a drug works in a person and how the escape mechanisms happen in the human system, it's very difficult to model that in an animal model. Um, so I think the models bring us, I do think that they give us great hypotheses, but at the end of the day, it's really what happens in people. Thank you, and I'll turn to Dr. Vincenzi. By the way, I, I yeah. have a magic wand, but uh, to overcome international barriers would require a truly miraculous magical wand. <laughs> but yeah. I'll turn to Dr. Vincenzi now. Well, it is very hard to add something because both Dr. Dr. Kelly and Dr. George uh, focus on exactly what I think it is the major barrier. So we should try to promote collaboration, but make easier also the regulatory processes. Actually, my country is definitely a big issue, and I'm really concerned that in the next years, the situation will be even worse. Uh, so probably it will become harder and harder to, to run, just to make an example, the, the, the collaboration between the, these 23 centers for receiving few data about the exon 9 uh, mutated GIS patient in the adjuvant setting uh, was quite difficult, but in a period of time in which we had got um, few, relatively few uh, barriers. Actually, the situation is becoming uh, extremely dangerous for making spontaneous researches. So uh, I think this is something that probably also the advocacy groups should try to, to help also to make more homogeneous the situation across the world. Yes, well, I think for that that's a theme that's run through the whole meeting for sure. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, actually, you've all, rather cheated, I think, because you've seen my second question and you've all already been answering it in a sense, but uh, I'll move on to my second question. So most GIST research is taking place in the US or in Europe, but there are patient advocacy groups in smaller countries, such as our own group in Canada or New Zealand or Australia. 
And we have developing countries like Chile and Kenya that are represented here. And they also want to support and encourage local GIST research. So what would you recommend as the best way for groups in smaller countries or that are less involved in, that are not at the forefront of GIST research? What would you recommend as a good way for us to uh, promote GIST research in our, in our own countries? Maybe let's go and reverse order and we'll start with Dr. Vincenzi. Well, um, I, I think this could be, well, it is the story of the rare diseases, the rare tumors. Uh, the uh, advocacy groups uh, from even small countries contributed a lot in the, in the research. So this, this could be replicated also for the GIST community. I think that by collaboration between also the advocacy groups should be promoted uh, exactly in the same uh, way at the same level uh, of the collaboration between uh, physician collaborative 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 groups uh, may, involving physicians. So uh, um, obviously also the activity of uh, uh, advocacy groups in uh, helping physician by achieving resources, financial resources, could be very helpful and it could be a useful tool uh, for helping also small countries uh, and uh, coming into the bigger um, uh, collaborative group. Thank you. And the other uh, doctors would like to comment? Yeah, you know, I think, I think understanding what the barriers are in individual environments and where the champions are in individual environments can help perhaps see what's possible in those spaces. So what do I mean by that? I mean, it might not be possible in some of the countries that you listed to do a phase one study with biopsies at every six weeks and blood draws at every you know eight hours and processing the samples and having them shipped all over everywhere. Maybe it is possible, I don't know. Um, so I think understanding what's possible, there are always questions that can be asked. And I think that's questions that can be answered. We just need to think about what the environment is and ask the questions that work in that space with, those, with the people that are interested in being involved and the champions to see it through. And uh, Dr. Kelly, any comments? Um, yeah, like just to echo the sentiments of Dr. George and Vincenzi. Um, again, I, I think even before the research question, you know, partnership uh, with centers, like if you could partner uh, a champion from a smaller country with a, a a sarcoma center in a more established uh, country um, and allow that then to develop both firstly from a clinical perspective and helping to answer complex clinical questions and being a support there of, for information and a resource. And then with that, hopefully that would foster, you know, development of, of research as well. So I think that's something that I would suggest might be meaningful to consider. Thank you. Uh, we have a few more minutes uh, left, so I, I'm going to read you a question that's come in from Deb. In a way, it anticipates our next session, but I think we can jump ahead to it. Uh, Deb asks, with regard to SDH deficient GIST, what do the research scientists here today need to move research forward in the area of SDH deficient GIST? Can I ask any of you to jump in on that question? Um, I actually think that, oops, um, I'm going to let the others, I, I, I'm just going to say briefly, I actually think that this is another great opportunity for collaboration and awareness. There's actually a, a fair bit going on in SDH deficiencies right now. And I think that there are, firstly, just the fact that it's spinning off is important, that it's being looked at separately, that the biology is being looked at separately. But this is because it's a rare subtype, 
we need to find ways to stay connected so that patients are aware when there are trials available. And we need to make the connection between the trials and the, and the patient community. I just have to get a quick urgent page. Yeah. I'll, I'll be back. I'll let the others respond. Um, I know, let's say from, I know that let's say from a preclinical uh, scenario when we're trying to develop like good rationale for a stage division, just I think that's, that seems to be a very challenging area. We don't have great cell lines within SDH deficient just so I think that's something that that hopefully in time and through collaboration we may be able to um, you know develop. I, I hope. I think that just our just patients are following the same destiny of more common diseases such as lung cancer, colorectal cancer. We are splitting into different molecular subsets uh, and also the, the old wild type gists uh, are becoming uh, more clear the molecular pathway and but but Chara uh, introduced the, this aspect the collaboration in a so rare medical condition is so crucial uh, I think that in the in the field of sarcomas uh, I can remember for instance the inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors uh, actually, we have all the ALK inhibitors uh, in this area for an extraordinary rare disease. Probably this, sh this should be replicated also for the SG SDH deficient GIST. Very, very rare, but we can do something all together. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've already seen from the pages going off in the background that uh, I've always said that medical oncologists are just about the busiest human beings on the planet. And uh, we very much ap really appreciate your uh, taking the time to give us all this uh, knowledge this morning. Um, I'm just going to read a comment that's come in. And I think we can all echo it. Uh, a patient who writes, as a newly diagnosed and treated just patient and a physician, in fact, I'm overwhelmed by this presentation and the information made available to this patient group. All of you are amazing and very appreciated. I think we can all very much echo that. You folks are all amazing. It's been a great, great morning. I think if it's okay with Sarah that we'll just uh, end the session at that point and take maybe a slightly, a slightly longer break before we come back on SDH deficient. Would that be okay, Sarah? Am I, am I allowed to do that on, on the spot? Sure.